Welcome into Mock Trial Masterclass, your guide to controlling the courtroom. I'm Luke and I want you to be a Mock Trial Master. Let's talk about how you can make that happen. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at an example of a really good direct examination and we're going to be breaking it down from both the attorney and the witness standpoint. Uh, this is from an old tournament in Tennessee from several years ago. That's my hometown. That's where I coach. That's where I competed in high school. And we're going to be looking at just a good example of a direct. It's a police investigator we're going to be hearing from talking about a case where uh, someone is being accused of strangling an old man in an assisted living facility. It's really fun to listen to. I like the attorney. I like the witness. We're going to be pausing to break it down and talk about what is happening that's really good so you can apply some of that stuff to your own direct examinations. So, you ready to hop in? Let's do it. What is your name? Augustine Johnny McSwain. Just pausing right off the bat. Every direct examination should start exactly like that. What is your name? Please tell us your name. I do not like the question, introduce yourself to the jury, because it is way too wide open. It leaves the door for the witness to ramble and get on this tangent that no one really cares about. And also, we want to be conversational when we talk to a jury, when we're talking to witnesses. And if we're being conversational, when was the last time you had a conversation with someone where you walked up and you said, please introduce yourself to me? Right? That has never happened in the history of the world. So ask the witness, please tell us your name just like this attorney just did. What do you do for a living? I'm an investigator with the Schrader City Police Department. How long have you been with the Schrader City Police Department? Seven years. How long have you been an investigator with the Schrader City Police Department? Since I graduated college in 2004. Where did you attend college? I attended Weston County University where I graduated with a double major in psychology and criminology. I would add that during my time there, I served in the Army Reserve. Could you talk a little bit about your service in the Army Reserve? Yes. Well, initially, I served as a psychological operations officer, and after I completed my studies, I served as a psychological operations specialist. What were some of your responsibilities as a psychological operations officer and specialist? Well, in these positions, I served many responsibilities, including the gathering, analysis, development and distribution of intelligence used for psychological effect. I would add that I also work to convey certain indicators and information to foreign audiences. So what this witness is really good at is knowing his character backwards and forwards, which is one of the most important things you can do as a witness on cross-examination. You've got to know your part inside and out because as a witness, you're supposed to be embodying the character that you're playing. You're not supposed to be a high schooler or a college student up there. You're supposed to be, you know, in this case, a police investigator. And the fact that he can rattle off these phrases, he can rattle off his experience in the way that he is, points to the fact that he's not a kid up there. He is a police investigator, and that's how you need to see him. This is really good stuff. We're going to skip ahead just a little bit in this direct so we can get to more of the substance of it. Investigator McSwain, were you involved in an investigation involving the defendant, Ms. Hadley Gruber? Uh, yes, I was. And is Hadley Gruber in the court today? Uh, yes, uh, she's sitting right there. Let the record reflect that my, my witness has identified the defendant. <laughs> Investigator, could you tell us how and when you first became involved in this investigation? Uh, yes, on July 3rd, 2016, the department received a 911 emergency call at approximately 1830 hours from Maple Leaf Manor, which is an assisted living facility in Schrader. I was dispatched at 1833 hours to investigate the call. Now to be clear, investigator, when you say 1830 hours, are you referring to 630 p.m.? Yes, uh, that's correct. Now what time did you arrive at Maple Leaf Manor? I arrived at 1842 hours or uh, 642 p.m. And what did you do at that point? Well, I proceeded to the receptionist's desk where I spoke with a woman by the last name of Bezel, a Mrs. Jewel Bezel, and I informed her of the 911 call. I inquired if there were any employees or residents by the name of Carl and determined that there was one resident, a Mr. Carl Gudenov. I also determined that there were no employees of that name. So one of your jobs as both an attorney and a witness 
on direct examination is to tell a story, right? The attorney is telling that story by asking good open-ended questions, right? Questions that start usually with who, what, when, where, why, that give the witness a chance to expound on their answers. And it's the witness's job to answer those questions in a captivating way that is filling the jury in on the story of whatever their character's involvement in the case was. I really like how this attorney-witness combo is going about that. It's very easy to follow what is happening everyone's kind of on the same page. Uh, you just want to employ these types of storytelling techniques in your direct examinations, making them engaging, making them easy to follow so that everyone, again, stays on the same page. And what did you do after speaking with Ms. Bezel? Well, I proceeded to Mr. Gudinov's room to investigate further. And what room in Maple Leaf Manor was that? Room number 204. Investigator, could you tell us what you saw or heard when you arrived at Mr. Gudinov's room? Yes, well, as I approached the door, I heard an individual wheezing and moaning on the inside. Miss Bezel knocked on the door, and immediately, the wheezing and the moaning grew louder, and there was a sound of frantic movement. At that point, Miss Bezel used her Axis uh, badge on the card on the door, and we gained entry to the Now, I, I want to highlight a word that he used at the beginning of that answer. He said there was an individual who was doing, you know, whatever. Now, usually I would not like that word individual because, again, we want to be conversational in mock trial, and that's not really a word that most people are going to use. You know, you wouldn't say, well, I, I went to the mall and I met this individual who, right, that, that, we don't really talk like that. But he's playing a police investigator, someone who's very buttoned up, who's wearing a suit and tie, right? And I think that under these circumstances, a police investigator might use the word individual, might use some more heightened language than we're used to using in conversation. And what that points to is another witness principle for direct, which is you need to be authentic. You need to be an authentic representation of whatever character you're playing. So in this case, He's playing a police investigator. He's dressed like a police investigator would be dressed. He's wearing a suit, right? Because a police investigator is most likely not going to be wearing your typical officer uniform. They're going to be dressed a little bit differently. He's nailing that here. But also, they're going to speak a little bit differently than the average person, right? They might use police language. He didn't say it here, but, you know, words like assailant, right? Individual. Those are the types of words that a police investigator would probably use. And this witness is doing a great job of embodying his character and using those types of words. That's a great example for all you witnesses out there to follow. And what did you observe upon entry to the room? Yes, well, I saw Mr. Gudinov lying in the middle of the floor. He was very agitated. Beside him was a telephone, a landline, consisting of a receiver and a base unit, as well as a cord that had been pulled away from the wall. Were you able to observe Mr. Gudinov's physical condition? I don't love that question. It's a little bit robotic. Were you able to observe his physical condition? Again, we want to be conversational, and that's probably not how we would say that in a conversation. A better way to ask that question might be, you know, what kind of condition was he in? What did you notice about him? Not, were you able to observe his condition? Again, just not very conversational. Yes, well, based on the 911 call and as a trained investigator, I was very concerned with Mr. Gudinov's condition. I determined that he was conscious, although he had been severely bruised around the neck and the throat region. Was Mr. Gudinov able to speak? Uh, yes. Although he was difficult, uh, difficult to understand, excuse me, he was, uh, I was able to take a statement. And how long after you arrived at Mr. Gudinov's room was it that you took the statement from him? Almost immediately. We are trained in circumstances like this to take statements as quickly as possible. And what was Mr. Gudinov's state throughout your interview with him? Uh, he was very agitated. And please tell us what he said. Now, I'm going to pause here because I have seen this direct before. And what I know is about to happen is there's going to be a hearsay objection and it's going to get sustained. We're going to skip through that because I actually disagree with the decision to sustain that objection. But what's happening right here, these last few questions have been setting up the hearsay exception. What they're ultimately going to argue is that this isn't hearsay, but that rather it's an excited utterance. If you don't know what excited utterance is, you can go check out my video on hearsay exceptions. But what I want to point out is that knowing they're going to use a hearsay exception, before they get to that question where they say, what did 
the person say, where you know that objection to hearsay is going to come, they ask foundational questions. So excited utterance has a few elements. There, you know, there has to be someone in a state of excitement. Uh, you don't really want a whole lot of time to pass because you want them to still be in that excited state after a startling event. And they're asking questions to clearly lay the foundation for the fact that that was the case. When you use a hearsay exception, you need to tell the judge where you're going before you get there by asking questions like this. So really, really effective. I wish it had worked. I, th I think it should have worked. I disagree with the fact that it didn't. But let's skip ahead to the end of this objection exchange so we can get back to watching this attorney and this witness interact in this direct examination. And investigator, would, would you please describe the process you took during your investigation? Well, at the hospital, I interviewed Dr. Addison Anderson. And, now, uh, investigator, is that the same Dr. Anderson who testified today? Uh, yes. And was the testimony he gave today in court consistent with the testimony he gave you on July 3rd? Uh, yes, sir, uh, it is. Now, uh, could you please continue on the process of your investigation? Uh, well, after I interviewed Dr. Anderson, I returned to Maple Leaf Manor, where I interviewed Deborah Black and Truth Beaverhausen. What did you review with Ms. Beaverhausen? Well, I spoke with Ms. Beaverhausen and was able to determine uh, access to the employee assignment logs and the network login catalog. What conclusion did you reach based on your review of these logs? Well, I determined that Hadley Gruber had been assigned to feed Mr. Gudinov that evening and that Hadley's badge had been used in the network login catalog immediately before the 911 call was placed. And now, without testifying to what Mr. Gudinov told you, when you spoke with Ms. Beaverhausen, did you tell her what Mr. Goodenough told you? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Invest An important reminder here, based on some of these last few questions, is that you, know, you have to treat the jury in mock trial as you would in real life, which is that they've never heard this case before. I mean, I can attest, when I go to judge mock trial tournaments, I don't read the case beforehand because I want to go into it fresh and see what the students are going to be able to do. And so you, as an attorney, need to be able to take that mindset of, hey, these guys don't know the case. And so you can't be throwing around names that people haven't heard, details of the case that people haven't heard. Right, we talked earlier about telling a story. Well, part of telling that story is giving them details at the appropriate time so they all make sense. So, you know, one of the worst pieces of evidence in this direct for the other side is the fact that, you know, the defendant's catalog number, like they were just talking about, came up on the computer database. Well, that's not where they started. It wasn't, you know, hi, my name is Officer Johnny McSwain, and his computer log came up at about the time of the incident, right? We got to that point eventually. It was a, maybe a bit of a slow burn, but, but we got there. The story made sense, and then all of a sudden now we hear that as a jury member, and we think, oh, okay, I got where this came from. I know the background to this, and I understand how this fits into the case. Really, really good job, again, of storytelling, laying foundation before we get to the big stuff and making sure the jury you know, knows where we've been, understands the story of the case. Peter, did you come to any conclusions from your investigation? Certainly, I did. And investigator, in your expert opinion, what happened on July 3rd, 2016? Well, based on my uh, service in the Army Reserve, my training in CIC, and over a decade of experience with the SCPD, I concluded that Hadley Gruber had repeatedly choked Carl Goodenough. Investigator, after the... So, I probably would have objected to that. So, we skipped over the fact where this witness was tendered as an expert witness. And, and I just don't really care for that opinion very much. And I'm kind of sitting here thinking, like, what specifically would I object to? I don't really know right off the bat. I would have to sit there and think about it. But it's one of those opinions that I don't really like because it's not the job of a police investigator to be talking to the jury about who was and who wasn't at fault. Now, there's nothing wrong necessarily with giving an opinion like that on the ultimate issue. In fact, it's expressly allowed under the 700 series of rules and the rules of evidence. However, in this situation, I just don't know that a police officer should be able to offer an opinion like that. I just don't think it's appropriate. I maybe would make a, a Rule 403 objection to this. I, I'm not quite sure. Maybe a Rule 702 objection that he doesn't quite have the foundation and his expertise to make an opinion like this. Just all told, I don't love this. When you call you know, police investigators or anyone like that to the stand in your mock trial rounds, I wouldn't do something like this because you're probably going to get an objection. And I just don't think it, it, it's quite the right time or place for that. Conclusion of your investigation, what action or actions did you take 
with respect to the evidence that you had gathered? Well, I went to the district attorney's office where I spoke with an assistant DA about the case and informed them of my conclusion. I then presented them with all of the materials that I had gathered over the case. And after your meeting with the DA's office, what happened? Well, about a week later, they filed charges against Hadley Gruber. And about a week after that, they petitioned for Hadley to be transferred from juvenile court to circuit court. Thank you, investigator. No further questions. So that's it. So maybe not the most exciting direct examination of all time, right? He's just sort of giving these details of these police and uh, this police investigation. Uh, but it's a great example of a storytelling direct examination where we're getting details of what happened slowly but surely, and it's all making really a lot of sense. Uh, this witness did a great job, I think, of embodying their character, of, of really being authentic, because again, we can obviously tell this is a high schooler on the witness stand, but it's a high schooler as a police investigator. Again, using the words a police investigator would use, dressed like a police investigator, right? Kind of slumped over with his hands like this. Uh, you know, that furrowed brow, that expression in his eyes was really, really good. Uh, so a lot you can take away from this direct to add to your own. And if you want some more tips on direct examination, there's a whole chapter in my book, Mock Trial Masterclass, on direct examination that you can read with even more tips for both attorneys and witnesses. If you want to pick up a copy, you can head to Amazon by clicking the link in the description on YouTube or the show notes on podcast platforms. Otherwise, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope that these tips were helpful for you, and I can't wait to hear about how your direct examinations rise to the level of a mock trial master.